Today for our Bite of History, I want to address an issue that was under discussion the other day. I want to talk about theories of migration and cultural development in North America. One uh, caveat, these are theories and as time progresses and new evidence is found, uh, there theories change, uh, some theories are confirmed or they find more evidence to support those theories, but it, it is never, probably will never be a definitive answer to migrations as to how they occurred, when they occurred, but I want to talk about three of the ones that are most accepted by uh, academics in the field and when I'm talking about in the field archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists, uh, geneticists, linguistic uh, scholars, all of these people are involved in looking at the evidence, searching for evidence uh, to try to answer the questions of when the migrations occurred and how they occurred. The first one I want to mention is what is called the Clovis First Theory. It is the one of the oldest theories. And this is the idea that people crossed the Bering Strait during a time period when the ice glaciers caused there to be uh, dry land between Alaska and Russia, uh, Siberia. And the people who crossed, usually, by accounts of evidence found, they were following their food source. So those who were crossing from Siberia uh, into North America were following the herds of the mastodons and other animals that were in existence at that time. So the Clovis first theory is the idea that um, people followed a pathway through the glaciers, in between the glaciers where it was possible to travel down into North America and then once out of the glaciers they began to disperse and spread from, um, from the center to the west to the east to the south, uh, developing different cultures as the migrations continued. And I'm not going to give a time period for these because, again, uh, according to which scholar you look at, uh, they have different ideas about when it happened, how many thousand years ago. But for an estimate, a uh, very rough estimate, probably between uh, 15,000, 14,000 years ago, uh, they believe that migration was happening across the Bering Strait. Now this is not something that happened in a matter of days or weeks or months or years even, but uh, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years this migration uh, was proceeding. Then a second theory uh, that is pretty well accepted by most scholars is called the Coastal Migration Theory. This is the idea, if you look at the map, you can see the lines uh, going northward along the east coast of China. Island hopping is, is the idea that the way people migrated over water rather than over land by going from island to island rather than crossing a wide expanse of water. And one of the things that is used to help solidify this claim or to give evidence for this claim is the appearance of ancient kelp beds. If uh, you know what kelp is, it is uh, sea vegetation that marine life eats from. Marine life fish, uh, lobster, crabs, whatever, uh, swims through these kelp beds and eats off of the kelp. And they found evidence of a, what they call a kelp forest, that makes that uh, loop 
up around, up on the, from the east coast of China across to the west coast of North America and down the coast. So the idea is that people following the food again made those uh, trips from island to island until they uh, reached the west coast of North America. One of the interesting artifacts that has been found to support this theory is in what is called the Paisley Caves in um, Washington or Oregon, I'm sorry, Oregon, where they have found feces, which appears to be from an animal, say like a wolf, but mixed in with the animal DNA, they have found human DNA. So um, either the animal ate the human, and that's how the DNA got mixed in, or perhaps both animals and humans use the Paisley Caves as a restroom. So that is one of the interesting things that has been found that, that uh, supports the time period and also the route, the island hopping route called the Coastal Migration Theory. And um, if we look at South American history, there's also the theory that uh, some People used, uh, went south instead of north, again following the islands, uh, reaching the west coast of South America. And there are many uh, archaeological sites that are located in both North America and South America that helps to support this theory. The third theory of migration is called the Salutrian Hypothesis. The Salutrians were a, a Stone Age people living in Europe and the idea of this Salutrian hypothesis is that they sailed from Europe to North America once again uh, during an ice age which allowed them to be able to, to cross. That is the idea that Europeans were the first ones to migrate into North America. But I will have to say that that hypothesis does not have a lot of support from the academic world. Uh, the evidence to support the Salutrian hypothesis is still very um, minimal. But it is one of the theories that uh, scholar scientists are looking at today to help answer the question uh, when and how were North America and South America populated. Moving uh, from the idea of uh, the separate theories, uh, this map shows all of the theories together uh, as their possible roots. So it shows the ice-free corridor, which is the Clovis first theory, and I forgot to mention the reason it's called Clovis is because in Clovis, New Mexico, uh, there was an archaeological dig and they found bones of mastodons with evidence of man-made arrowheads embedded in the bones of the mastodon, which indicates that there were humans at the time that that mastodon was killed. So, and there were several other artifacts that were found there at Clovis, and that's why it's called the Clovis First Theory, because of the archaeological dig there in Clovis, New Mexico. Also shows the Maritime Route and the Salutrian Route. As you can see, the Salutrian Route followed the ice around, so again, there was no need to cross a wide expanse of ocean. However, North America was populated. One of the things that is agreed on that it was food that was the motivator for the migrations. Uh, whether it was the uh, people coming across the Bering Strait following the animal herds 
or the coastal migration where they were following marine life, which was their food source. Once they got to North America, it depended on where they stayed, which helps to determine what kind of cultures develop. Um, so it was mostly determined by geography and climate as to what kind of cultures develop. So in North America, we see numerous cultures, different cultures that developed across the continent. On the west coast, uh, where there were plenty of forests, uh, they were close to the water, which was a source of food, as well as the forest being a source of food. The forest also supplied building material to build their shelters. So they developed uh, more or less permanent settlements, and they were a sedentary culture, meaning they didn't move around. Everything they needed was right there. Uh, those who stayed on the plains in the central part of North America were nomadic. Um, there wasn't much plant life, not a lot of water, trees, not a lot of trees. So those who stayed in the central part continued depending on animals as their source of food. So we have the nomadic culture, the Plains Indians. They, um, you could say, they're the first ones to build, the, build mobile homes. They, since there weren't a lot of trees, trees when they came across a river where there were some trees along the banks of the river, they would find poles to create a teepee. They would use the skins from the animals to cover the, the poles. So this was a type of dwelling that they could take down, bundle together, and carry with them as the herd moved. They moved along with the herd. And before the Spanish came to the Americas, they had no horses. There were no horses in North America at this point in time. So they walked. They used dogs for pack animals. Um, so they would even either carry their belongings on their own back or harness them to dogs. They made uh, kind of sleds called travois out of these poles uh, wrapped together with animal sinew and hide to create like a sled to put their belongings on uh, and the dogs um, could pull those as well as humans could strap themselves to those sleds and pull them across the plains. So a nomadic culture that continued to be nomadic all the way into the 1800s. Now in the southwest which would be states like um, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Utah. Uh, in the southwest, it's hot, dry, um, not a lot of trees, but there's a lot of scrub brush, um, like pinyon, um, mesquite. But there was sand uh, and clay and they would take what was available to build their shelters. And of course, what I'm talking about is adobe. They would take the, uh, the clay, uh, the sand, a little bit of brush, mix it together and make like blocks uh, to create adobe dwellings. Those adobe dwellings, baking in the hot sun of the Southwest, lasted thousands of years. In fact, uh, if you visit the Southwest today, uh, you can see a lot of uh, remains of these adobe uh, pueblos. I have some images on another slide I'll show in a few minutes of some of those dwellings. Now, in the Midwest, uh, the Ohio Valley, the Mississippi, along the Mississippi River, the closest thing to a civilization that existed in North America was called the Mississippian culture or the mound builders. They're the ones who built earthen mounds 
sometimes in the shape of animals or birds. These mounds, one of the mounds that still is in existence in Cahokia, Illinois, um, called Monk's Mound, and this is just northeast of St. Louis, Missouri. And Monk's Mound is a hundred feet high, and you can visit it today. It is has a lot of historic things, uh, a tourist attraction. There is a difference of opinion of the purpose of the mounds. They don't appear to have been built as burial tombs uh, like the pyramids in Egypt, although they have found some human remains in some of the mounds. It's more like they were inserted into the mound, uh, maybe after the fact, but they're really, uh, most scholars do not believe that the mounds were built as burial mounds, but that they played some part in the religion of the area. So that on top of these mounds, they found um, remains of buildings that could have been temples. I think it is on Monk's Mound that they have found posts driven into the ground and the opening, the post hole, is like three feet across, which gives the uh, impression that it must have been a very tall building uh, that needed that kind of support. Uh, so we have the mounds and the people build their homes uh, around the mound. and. These uh, cities, Cahokia, which was supposed to be one of the largest uh, cities in North America at the time, maybe a population of 10 to 12,000 people, and they lived uh, around the mound. So the mound builders, the reason I say that they are the closest thing to a civilization is because there's evidence that they had a uh, trade system where they traded with uh, other areas. In fact, they have found remains of, uh, or artifacts that could have only have come from um, the Gulf Coast. So that uh, the idea is there that they had a trade system, they had a political system, religious system, uh, they shared a common language, all the things that are necessary for a settlement or for an area to be called civilized. So the mound builders, a uh, very important part of uh, the population in North America. Then in the east, on the east coast, uh, a lot of woodlands, coastal waters, uh, a lot of rivers, and so the uh, culture that developed there was also sedentary. On the East Coast, uh, the culture would uh, be very similar to that on the West Coast, depending on the woodlands and the coastal waters for food, as well as building materials. Then in the Southeast, and we're talking an area that would include uh, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, where it is hot, humid, swampy. Um, they're also going to develop a very sedentary culture, the type of dwellings, shelters that they build, um, are usually built up on uh, poles with perhaps open sided with maybe a roof maybe not a roof, maybe just a platform, in order to be able to catch the, any breeze, um, any cool air that might circulate. And of course, food source uh, included very many things like snakes, alligators, um, marine life, uh, small animals. So all of these areas in North America developed sedentary cultures except for the Plains Indians, which were nomadic. But where, wherever it was, 
there were, there were millions of people living in North America before 1492. Uh, I said I had some images. Um, here's an image of southwestern cultures. There is the cliff dwellers where they built adobe structures right in the cliffs um, so that it's uh, maybe a hundred feet to the top of the cliff, maybe a hundred feet down to the uh, bottom of the canyon. And again, there's a lot of different theories about why they built uh, right in the cliffside. But they're adobe structures. As you can see, um, top left is uh, Mesa Verde in Colorado between Cortez and Durango, which those, those are ancient ruins that are thousands of years old and they still exist. Now, there has been some uh, crumbling of these dwellings, but um, a lot of them are very intact. Then in the bottom right, another example of cliff dwellers, um, Canyon de Chez in Utah, a great example of these adobe dwellings in the cliffs. And of course, all across Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, uh, you can find adobe dwellings that uh, date back thousands of years. Um, also on that same slide, you can see some of the tools, flint tools, that were made by these um, southwestern cultures. Then there's an image, three images, of nomads on the plains. Uh, one shows them uh, hunting and killing a mastodon, a village with the teepees, and hunters uh, looking down on a herd of what appears to be buffalo. Once the mastodon and some of those other ice age animals um, disappeared, then it was the buffalo that became the main source of both food, building supplies, uh, medicine, uh, clothing, everything uh, came from the buffalo. Then there are three images, four images there of mound building culture. You have uh, uh, the bottom right is a photograph of the Serpent Mound in Cahokia, Illinois, part of the Cahokian culture. And right above that is uh, an artist's concept of what mound building, uh, mound builder city would have looked like, with the center part being an area for um, ceremonies or play. And mound builders, um, from evidence that has been found, they had a game that they loved to play. Uh, it involved a, a stone, a rock, and sticks, and but appeared to be a, a team sport. Then you have the images on the left, which show the type of dwellings that they built, that they lived in. Uh, so an example of the bound building culture. Then there's images of the woodland hunters uh, on the east coast. They built what, would, what were called long, what they call longhouses, and they were walled villages um, for food. They hunted, but also, as time went on, they uh, domesticated a lot of items like uh, the potato, corn. Um, other food sources that were wild originally that these people, uh, not just the woodland hunters but also in the southwest, um, they would domesticate these food sources until they, they uh, had extensive agriculture in North America before 1492. In fact, um, according to scholars, in North America, there was a greater variety and a uh, greater quantity of food crops 
that were grown by Native Americans. So with all of these cultures, by 1492, there were millions of people living in North America. It was not a new land. Uh, it had been populated for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but there was, before Columbus, there was no recorded, sustained contact with other parts of the world. That is, from Europe, Asia, or Africa. Now, we're not discounting the Vikings. We know that the Vikings came to North America in the, at least by the 10th century, but they didn't stay. There have been a lot of archeological discoveries in North America, on the northern uh, coast of Newfoundland, that definitely um, proves that uh, Norsemen, Vikings, had reached North America. But they didn't stay and they didn't leave any records of the fact that they had been in North America. When we talk about North America, we're talking about an area almost five times the size of Europe. Five times the size of Europe with a greater population, greater agriculture than Europe with numerous distinct cultures. For our next bite of history, um, I want to talk a little bit about the Vikings and also about the Chinese. Um, the fact that the Chinese may have reached at least South America before Columbus. In fact, um, almost a hundred years before Columbus. But that's for next time. I would appreciate reading your comments and suggestions for history topics that interest you uh, or questions that you'd like to have addressed. And if I don't know the answers, I do know how to find them. Uh, don't forget to look in the box below for references, uh, for links to find more information. Thank you for viewing. Please come back. No, that wasn't what I wanted to say. <laughs> Good thing you have editing. I'll leave it up to you.